Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is David Elwood, and I want to welcome you here to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, this is a special occasion for a number of reasons. The first is that this is the Albert H. Gordon Lecture, which was established in 1987 through a gift uh, from Mr. Gordon, who received his undergraduate uh, degree in, from Harvard in 1923 and his MBA in 1925. Uh, the lecture focuses on the fields of finance and public policy, special attention to internationalization, and the terms of the lecture specify the speaker should generally be chosen from outside the Harvard community. Well, I think Singapore is a bit of a distance, although uh, in terms of someone, this is someone who's very much been a part of our community in so many different ways. Um, I will definitely say that uh, our speaker is a remarkable man. He's uh, Kishore uh, Mahambani's uh, career in public service is, spans government, academia, and exemplifies the commitment of advancing the greater good, spirit of innovation that we here strive for. He graduated with first class honors with a degree of uh, philosophy from the University of Singapore. Uh, he then went to Delhi's University in Canada where he received a master's in philosophy and an honorary doctorate. Uh, he's also spent a year here as a fellow at the Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. Now he entered the his first part of his career was with the Singapore Foreign Service where he served between 1971 to 2004. Um, he's had postings in Cambodia and he actually served during the war in Cambodia there 1973 to 74. Malaysia, Washington DC and New York. He served as two with two stints as Singapore's ambassador to the UN and as president of the UN Security Council. He was a permanent secretary at the foreign ministry for five years. And then he became a dean of a public policy school, everyone's dream job. Um, <clears throat> sure, he was president of the UN Security Council, but um, indeed he became dean of Singapore's Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, interestingly enough, about the exact time I became dean here. Now, I think I know a thing or two about what it means to be a dean in a school uh, with a name of an iconic public figure uh, of whom the nation is proud. Um, and I certainly have been enormously uh, honored to be here at the Kennedy School. Keyshore took over the school in the name of a living legend. And uh, talk about high expectations. Um, Lee Kuan Yew, is or was a remarkable leader and uh, has been vigorous and engaged, was vigorous and engaged throughout his life. He was one who believed very deeply in the power of education and the notion of a strong, um, merit-based, uh, highly accountable government with essentially no corruption to be tolerated at any cost. And um, Kishore took over that role of the, running a school with a living legend, and honestly, the Kennedy schools enjoyed a very close relationship with the Lee Kuan Yew School for many years, uh, including through the Lee Kuan Yew Fellows Program, in which mid-career students in public uh, management from the LKY School spent a semester here as residents. Um, we've benefited immeasurably from that association, as well as learned so many lessons from watching Singapore emerge as a remarkable nation uh, at a remarkable time. And I too have had this enormous pleasure of getting to know um, Kishore. Um, I remember the first time I met him in, was in Davos. And again, we had just both become deans. I think we were both a little s concerned about, uh, was, I'll just be straight, I was scared. Um, and uh, here's this guy, and so he sort of compare, compares you know, what we've done before. And you know, so I'm meeting this guy who's, oh, well, I was, you know, President of the Security Council, Ambassador to the UN, various things and so forth. I said, well, I studied poverty. Um, but the, um, and in fact, a great friendship was born. And throughout the years, we've spent a great deal of time together and so forth. Um, obviously, uh, Lee Kuan Yew, the, the remarkable uh, leader of Singapore, passed away uh, very recently at the age of 92. And we certainly, uh, share the grief of, of all the people in Singapore and what a remarkable man he was. Uh, I would also just say that one of the things I comforted myself when we were meeting in that first time in Davos was, well, okay, but, you know, I'm going to lean the, the Kennedy School and so forth and 
Um, we'll just see what he does after he becomes dean. Well, what he just did was write book after book after book that was on the bestseller list, that was uh, 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 talked about, argued about. These include The Great Convergence, Asia, the West, and the Logic of One World, um, a series of books including Can Asians Think, and uh, constantly he has pushed and challenged us to think about what a world will look like when the center of gravity shifts from the United States and the West to the East. And um, indeed, uh, now there's all kinds of talk about what's next for Singapore, and his, his uh, forthcoming book here, Can Singapore Survives, about it. Um, it is no surprise that this man who's done so many remarkable things, both in running an institution and in his writings, uh, was uh, uh, listed by the British Current Affairs magazine Prospect as one of the top 50 think world thinkers in 2014, and he's won so many different awards, I cannot uh, mention them. Um, but I think the simplest way to frame this is to indeed say, um, uh, Kishore is by far the best way to answer the question posed provocatively in your book, Can Asians Think? <laughs> so with no further ado, <laughs> Kishore Mahambani. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, the trouble with having such a generous introduction like that is that after that, everything is downhill. <laughs> the best I can do is sit down and keep quiet. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, it's a great pleasure and, and delight to be here. And I'm really glad you highlighted the very special relationship, David, uh, that our two schools have. And indeed, frankly, uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, which began in 2004, has been successful because it inherited a public policy program that was set up by the Harvard Kennedy School in Singapore in 91, I believe. So. We've inherited a lot of uh, from the wisdom and advice from the Harvard Kennedy School. I want to thank you uh, very much for that. I also want to thank you for mentioning uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, who, as you know, uh, who passed away. I think I'm not giving a big secret away if I say that he was a great fan of Harvard. And he really treasured the relationship that the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy had established with the Harvard Kennedy School, and he strongly encouraged me uh, to keep it up, and I think he'd be very happy to see that the Lee Kuan Yew School is being recognized here again at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School. Now, let me try to now begin my remarks uh, in 25 minutes to answer the question. I do have actually uh, quite a long text, but uh, I, I, will, I will not, I think it will be put up on your website of the Harvard Kennedy School, on my website too. What I'll give you is uh, a kind of a summary uh, of the lecture. But let me uh, start at the beginning uh, by saying that, you know, in America, I know you begin with a joke. Uh, unfortunately, we Asians, we don't have jokes. <laughs> I think my, the title of my next book will be Can Asians Joke? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to uh, st uh, steal, uh, frankly, literally a joke that was told by one of my predecessors in this uh, Albert A. Gordon series. Uh, his name was Richard Fisher, and this is how he began his lecture when he gave this Gordon lecture in 2009. He said, quote, yesterday morning as I got on the plane to fly up here, I turned to Nancy and I said, his wife Nancy, and said, in your wildest dreams, do you ever envision me following in the footsteps of Mikhail Gorbachev George H.W. Bush, David Rockefeller, and Ban Ki-moon in giving the Gordon Lecture at the Kennedy School. And Nancy replied, quote, I hate to let you down, Richard, but after 35 years of marriage, you rarely appear in my wildest dreams. <laughs> I think my wife who's here would say exactly the same thing. <laughs> so anyway, to... To begin, you know, the, in the spirit of the, uh, uh, again, the Gordon Lecture, who, who said we should talk about developments in the financial sphere, the way, I put, uh, the, the way I'm going to deliver my remarks is that I'm going to first tell you three stories from the financial sector, and then later at the conclusion, I'll explain to you why these three stories are important. And in terms of explaining and trying to answer the question, I'll first try to answer the question 
Of course, what are China's goals and aspirations as it tries to emerge and rise? Secondly, how has the relationship between United States and China played a role in uh, influencing the rise of China? And finally, I'll try to answer the, uh, make the point, and which is, I guess, the critical point I'm going to make at the very end, that how China behaves as number one will be very strongly influenced by how America behaves as number one. And that's why these three stories uh, are important, and that's why I'll begin with them. The first story is about an event that happened uh, at the height of the global financial crisis in 2008-2009. And until that financial crisis came about, the Chinese were very happy they had de that they had developed an interdependent relationship with the United States of America. So that while China uh, relied on America to sell its exports and to buy uh, its products, America, in turn, relied on China to buy U.S. Treasury bills and to make sure that you know the U the, that um, the U.S. could continue to sell these Treasury bills overseas. So they both felt that, as as uh, Tom Friedman said in one of his columns, that they were joined at the hip in a mutually interdependent relationship. And indeed, I can tell you this, uh, as a matter of fact, at the height of the crisis, when things looked really bad, the Bush administration actually sent an envoy to Beijing in 2008 and said, please continue buying U.S. Treasury bills because that's what we need to preserve global financial stability. And the Chinese were happy to do so, and I suspect the Chinese even felt a bit smug. See, the Americans depend on us. But then, lo and behold, about a month later, in a, in a move that completely shocked the Chinese, the US Fed announced the first round of QE measures in November 2008. And as you know, with the QE measures, essentially the US could print money to buy US Treasury bills. And lo and behold, the Chinese said, what's happened to this interdependence the Chinese, the Americans can just turn on the printing press and take away this dependence on China. And indeed, one commentator at Axel Merck said, the US is no longer focusing on the quality of its treasuries. In the past, Washington sought to promote a strong dollar through sound fiscal management. Today, however, policymakers are simply printing greenbacks and Merck said that by relying on the Federal Reserve's printing press, the US has effectively told other nations, it's our dollar, but it's your problem. So that's one story about the relationship, financial relationship between US and China. Then you mentioned a second story from the financial world, which I think not many people notice. Now, I think you, you must have, of course, you must have heard that the United States has been prosecuting several foreign banks, including HSBC, RBS, UBS, Credit Suisse, and Standard Chartered. Now, for example, Standard Chartered Bank was fined $340 million for making payments to Iran. And most Americans reacted with equanimity to this fine paid by Standard Chartered Bank and thought that the bank was just being fined for dealing with the evil Iranian regime. However, few Americans actually notice that Standard Chartered Bank, which was domiciled in the UK, had broken no British laws and had not violated any UN Security Council sanctions, but because the payments made through the Standard Chartered system went through the New York clearing system, the US dollars entered the territory of uh, US laws, and so Standard Chartered Bank was fined. And this is what is called, by the way, extraterritorial application of domestic laws. Again, remember this story when I come to the conclusion. And the third story is about 
the SWIFT system, S-W-I-F-T. Uh, I think many of you may know what it is. Uh, it's a system for clearing payments between countries. I think it's centered in Brussels. And when things got very rough between the United States and Russia, recently, as you know, uh, the United States said that it might consider denying access to Russia to the SWIFT system. And in a column by Farid Zakaria, one of our mutual friends, a graduate of Harvard, he described the Russian reaction to the possibility of being denied access to the SWIFT system. And, and interestingly enough, you know, most of us, when you look at Russia, we think Putin is the bad guy, Medvedev is a nice guy, good guy, but there was a good guy, Medvedev, who said, he said, the Russian response to any denial of access to SWIFT will know no limits. So clearly, again, this was a global system for clearing payments, and the United States was trying to use it for uh, either for bilateral relations in terms of punishing Russia. Now, these are the three stories I'm telling you at the beginning, and I'm going to conclude with these stories uh, at the end. Now, first of all, let me now answer the three questions that I mentioned earlier. First, what are China's goals and aspirations as it emerges as number one? And here, the most obvious point that I need to make and emphasize at the outset is that even though China, as you know, is still run by the Chinese Communist Party. I can assure you of one thing, the Chinese leaders, unlike Stalin or Lenin or Khrushchev, have no desire to prove the superiority of the communist system. In fact, as you know, Khrushchev famously said in November 18, 1956, whether you like it or not, history is on our side, we will bury you. Now, the Chinese don't have the kind of aspirations that the Russians had to in any way prove the superiority of the communist ideology. So if it's not communism that they're trying to promote, what is it they're trying to promote? And the simple answer is that they would just like to revive Chinese civilization. Indeed, if there's one thing that motivates the Chinese leaders, it is their memory of the many humiliations that China has suffered for over a century, as you know, from 1842, the Opium War, to roughly uh, 1949, or you can even go beyond that. And the one thing that drives the Chinese is a simple credo which says, no more humiliation for China. That's the great motivation. And indeed, Xi Jinping, when he spoke to UNESCO in March 2014, this is what he said are the goals of the Chinese people. He said the Chinese people are striving to fulfill the Chinese dream of the great renewal of the Chinese nation. The Chinese dream is about the prosperity of the country, the rejuvenation of the nation, and the happiness of the people. It reflects both the ideal of the Chinese people today and our time-honored tradition to seek constant progress. The Chinese dream will be realized through balanced development and mutual reinforcement of material and cultural progress. Without the continuation and development of civilization or the promotion and prosperity of culture, the Chinese dream will not come true." Unquote. And I think in, that, in those few sentences, he brilliantly captured what is the heart of the aspirations of the Chinese people, to move away from an era of having been humiliated for a long time 
to an era where they once again feel proud about Chinese civilization and what it can accomplish. And indeed, if the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, could change its name to CCP, the Chinese Civilization Party, then I think it would be a more accurate description of the goals and aspirations uh, of the CCP. But of course, while this may be the motivations, many in the West continue to believe that China's approach is flawed because it is not changing its political system. And you know, you can read in, you know, whatever, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, The Economist, there's this constant belief that the best thing that can happen to China is to have a collapse of the Chinese Communist Party and have a democratic system. The one slightly provocative point I'm going to make here is be careful what you wish for. Because if the Chinese political system becomes more democratic, it could very well become far more nationalist and far more aggressive as a power. And the great paradox here is that the Chinese Communist Party is actually delivering a global public good by restraining Chinese nationalism. And if you didn't have a strong Chinese Communist Party in charge, you might actually get a more nationalist, a more assertive China. So I believe that it's actually in global interest to allow the Chinese Communist Party to evolve and change in its own way. And that way, I think we will have a China that focuses on economic growth and focuses on strengthening its civilization. Let me now turn to the second question I said I would discuss, which is US-China relations, because clearly the relationship between the world's number one power, which today is United States, and the world's number one emerging power, China, is a key dynamic. And here, it is actually remarkable how stable the US-China relationship is. Uh, you know, in theory, when the world's number one emerging power is about to surpass the world's number one power, and as you know, in PPP terms, China did surpass the United States in 2014. You should be seeing naturally, logically, and I think Steve Wall might agree, uh, rising levels of tension between US and China. But instead, quite remarkably, we're seeing a very stable and indeed a calm relationship. And of course, the question is why. And here I think we have to give, we have to pay a lot of tribute to the United States for having managed very well the relationship with China. If indeed the United States has been remarkably benign over the years uh, towards China, starting from the days of 1990s, I mean, of course, much starting, of course, from the Cold War and Kissinger's trip and <coughs> America's efforts to bring China on board in the, in the Cold War alliance against uh, the Soviet Union, and then uh, opening up uh, the American market, as I mentioned earlier, to Chinese products. And even after the Tiananmen episode of 1989, when relations between US and China could have taken a nosedive, uh, US-China relations continued in an even keel. Actually, I remember vividly in 1992, listening to the election speeches of Bill Clinton when he said famously in his campaign, I will not coddle the butchers of Beijing if I become president of America. And when he became president, you, 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 we could have very well seen a sharp nosedive in the relations between the US and China Instead, to my surprise, and I actually saw this in my own eyes, in November 1993, at the first APEC leaders meeting, which was held in Blake Island off Seattle, 
that's the first time that Bill Clinton and Chiang Sun Min met face to face. And I could see that Chiang Sun Min was incredibly uncomfortable, tense and nervous and trying to figure out what the US president would do to him in this small close meeting where I was present. And to Chiang Sun Min's surprise and to my surprise, Bill Clinton coddled the butcher of Beijing. And it was a very wise decision on his part. And by the end of the day, if you had watched the body language of Chiang Se Min and Bill Clinton, amazingly, they were almost good friends at the end of the day, reflecting the great charm of Bill Clinton uh, at the time. But this, this pattern has continued. The uh, United States has helped China by getting it into WTO. The United States has helped China by being sensitive on Taiwan, indeed coming down very hard on the leaders of Taiwan when they tried to push for independence of Taiwan. So these are various ways in which the United States has demonstrated its wisdom and generosity towards the Chinese. And of course, speaking in Harvard University, I have to mention it is actually quite remarkable that the world's number one power is training the elite of the world's number one emerging power by allowing it to send 275,000 students to come and study in American universities. I think future historians will be wondering why was America so generous in supporting the rise of its number one uh, emerging power. But these, all this have led to this geopolitical miracle that we have today, where you have a stable relationship between US and China. And also, by the way, I also have to mention that Chinese themselves have been very careful and sensitive and some from time to time actually bent over backwards to keep the relationship uh, on an even keel. Uh, I was just in Belgrade literally two weeks ago and it's the first time I've gone to a modern city and saw, saw the results of bombing by NATO on skyscrapers and of course Belgrade is significant because as you know the Chinese embassy in Belgrade was bombed in 19. Uh, 99. Uh, almost all Americans I speak to believe that it was obviously an accident, but 100% of the Chinese I've spoken to are convinced it was deliberate. But despite the fact of their belief that it's deliberate, they swallowed the humiliation and said, our relations with the US are far too important. We will swallow our humiliation this time and proceed. So both sides, you can see, have made an effort to keep the relationship uh, on an even keel. So all this brings me to my third part. How American behavior and actions will have a significant influence uh, on China's uh, role as a number one power. And here, I must confess to you, in all honesty, that even though I'm normally quite provocative in things I say, I feel a certain trepidation here uh, in saying some of the things that I'm going to say uh, in this section. Because as you know, uh, very famously, Bob Zelig many years ago called on China to emerge as a responsible stakeholder of the global system. But when he made that call, I think he assumed that of course, the United States is a responsible stakeholder of the global system. And the hard part here is to try and tell the Ameri an American audience that that's not how of the United States is often perceived overseas. And that's why I told the three stories from the financial sector uh, at the beginning of my lecture, because the rest of the world quite often sees the United States acting unilaterally, acting in its own interests, and often at the expense of global interests. And David mentioned that I've been the uh, uh, ambassador to the UN, uh, twice I was there. I've served there for almost 10 years. And it's, it's, it's rather tragic to watch in the UN as I did at first hand, 
to see that the institutions that were in essentially created uh, by the United States after World War II with the guidance of FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt and all that, these were basically American-inspired institutions which have then been undermined by American policies. And I think in many ways the United States has been very unwise in undermining these global institutions because every action that the United States makes in undermining these global institutions could then be replicated by China. And that's why in my latest book, The Great Convergence, uh, I decided to begin the book by quoting from a very wise speech that Bill Clinton gave, uh, am I allowed to mention Yale, uh, in 2003. And this is what Bill Clinton said. If you believe that maintaining power and control and absolute movement an absolute freedom of movement and sovereignty is important to your country's future, there's nothing inconsistent in that. The US is the biggest and most powerful country in the world now. We've got the juice and we're gonna use it. But then he added a but, Bill Clinton. He said, but if you believe we should be trying to create a world with rules and partnerships and habits of behavior that we, would like to live in when we are no longer the military, political, economic superpower in the world, then you wouldn't do that. So Bill Clinton was being very wise in saying, you know, as long as America thinks he'd be number one, yes, we can go on undermining multilateral institutions. But if we can conceive of a world in which we are number two, then surely it is in America's interest to strengthen multilateral rules and processes. But what is strange is that Bill Clinton only gave the speech once and never repeated that again. Because I'm told it's political suicide in America to speak about America being number two. So most politicians uh, tend to veer away from that possibility. But I think the time has come for the United States to think very hard about a world in which it might become number two and China might become number one. Then surely America's interests change dramatically. And that's why if America wants to see a China emerge plays by global multilateral rules and processes, the best way you can do so is not by giving speeches or saying eloquent words about how you should preserve the global system. The best way you do it is through your deeds. And here, of course, I'm going to conclude by mentioning briefly the latest episode that has happened in US-China relations, and which is, of course, as you know, is the uh, Chinese decision to set up an Asian infrastructure investment bank, which unwisely the United States decided to oppose. And as you know, and this is in many ways a sign of the times, in the past, a veto by Washington DC would have meant that all the allies would have stood firmly behind the United States and the United States veto would have held. But even to my surprise, the first country to break that veto was the number one ally of the United States, which is the United Kingdom. And that's a sign of the times, that countries are now preparing for a world in which the United States will no longer be number one. So if you want to have that world to be a peaceful and orderly one, the time has therefore come for the United States to ask a very simple question. 
would the United States feel comfortable living in a world where China behaves just as America did when it was a sole superpower? Thank you. Thank you, Kishore. Um, so it, we now have time for questions. As you all know, there are microphones in four locations, one here, one right there, one there, and one there. And the characteristics of a good question at the, at the Kennedy School <laughs> have three characteristics. One, you identify yourself. Second, it is short and has but one point. And third, it ends with a question mark. So why don't we start right over there? <coughs> good evening, sir. Hi, my name is Nico. I'm a mid-career student here at the Kennedy School. I'm also the co-founder of the Future Society at the Kennedy School, which is a new student club. And my question regards the role of, of China, the future of role of China in the Middle East. Uh, we've seen the Middle East being the, uh, the big area of tension for the past decades. And uh, I was surprised to see, if, I'm, if I recollect properly, that the first trip of the newly elected Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi at the time was to go to China not to the U.S., which I saw personally as a big sign. And I was wondering whether you could share with us your perspective of how the region, the Middle East, could change uh, in this new era of Chinese rise. Thank you. Should I answer? Yes, yeah. go ahead. I mean, that, you know, the, it is a, this is actually a very difficult question to answer because, I mean, the, the tragedy about the Middle East is that it is the great exception in a world, as I try to demonstrate in a great convergence, which is actually prospering and doing very well. And because that region is a great exception, and to be very candid with you, it has a very dysfunctional dynamic. It is a very difficult region to have any kind of long-term uh, posture or plans. I am very confident that the Chinese want to see stability in the Middle East, but the Chinese will never try to play the role of the United States, which is to go in there and intervene directly and try to influence the political development either inside countries, as with the invasion of Iraq, or in, in the relations between countries, and so on and so forth. So, and the, so when the Chinese emerge, the one thing they will not try to do is to try and replicate American policies in the Middle East. So next question is right over here. Do note there's microphones here and here, and since I just go around, if you're standing in line, head to one of the other microphones. Hello, my name is Patrick. Um, thanks so much for this very thoughtful and inspiring talk. Um, as a German, I try to be the diplomat between the US and China. So my question is, um, how can millennials contribute to, as Kissinger would say, a peaceful coexistence between the U.S. and China? Uh, I think the, the millennials have an enormous uh, contribution to make. And the first thing they should do is read my book, The Great Convergence. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you, and it's a serious point I'm making here. I mean, I'm selling my book, but I'm also making a very serious point. The, See, the one key point that many people have not understood is that there are many respects in which the way the world has changed fundamentally, but one way in which it has changed fundamentally is that, uh, and I use a simple boat metaphor to explain this change, in the past when 7 billion people live in 193 separate countries, it was as though they were living in 193 separate boats with captains and crews taking care of each boat and rules to make sure the boats didn't collide. Now that's the old world order. Now, what's happened is that the world has shrunk and it's become small, dense, interdependent. So the 7 billion people in the world no longer live in 193 separate boats. The 7 billion people literally live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. But you only have, you have captains and crews taking care of each cabin and no captain or crew taking care of the global boat as a whole. And that's why you have global financial crisis, that's why you have global warming, that's why you have global terrorism, that's why you have global um, um, uh, pandemics happening also. So I think 
my generation's problem is that we've got so used to the idea that the only way you solve the problems in the world is by getting independent sovereign countries to talk to each other and resolve the problems. But the world has changed so much that our ideas about how to handle the world of tomorrow are still bound by 90, in fact, it's bound by 17th century Westphalian concept. So we, the millennials have to persuade the leaders of all the countries that the things that make us interdependent in the world are far greater than the things that divide us. And you've got to find a way of throwing away all the textbooks you use in the Harvard Kennedy School and write new textbooks. <laughs> so it's very clear we should, we should put your textbook number one. There we are. Uh, right here, please. I'm a mid-career MPA student here at the Kennedy School and I'm a big fan of yours. I'm so glad to see you. Uh, my question is, I mean, I've been following your readings and Thomas Friedman and Farid Zakaria, everybody talking about the post-American world. When you look at the world's top 20 universities, not a single university is from China, or at least top 10 universities. Mm. There's not one from China. You see, universities are not like stadiums that you're preparing for Olympic Games. It takes you 10 years to prepare stadiums. Like, look at institutions like Harvard or Yale, you know, it has taken 300 years to establish institutions like Harvard. How is China planning to fill that gap of universities? Because like you so religiously talk about the power of in higher education of institutions. So how is China gonna address that issue if it's gonna be the world number one power when like not a single university from China ranks among the top 10 universities in the world? Yeah. Well, it, 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 since I lost, I see quite a few questions. I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to give very short, quick answers. Huh? Uh, firstly, I'm very pleased to inform you that uh, I think about two, three weeks ago, the New York Institute for International Education, IIE, came out with a new book called Asia as the Next Higher Education Superpower. And the introductory essay was co-written by me and uh, a fellow author. Uh, Tanning, uh, the provost, uh, please, please read that essay uh, because it actually gives you a lot of data to talk about trend lines. Yes, it's true that the largest, the best universities in the world are still in America. And so it'll take some time, but the trend line is very powerful in terms of development of new universities, institutions of higher education, so forth. But the second point, which is a, which is a very critical point that I need to make here is that America has been remarkably generous to the world by training the elites of the world in American universities. And I always say that one reason why East Asia has defied all conventional wisdom and why East Asia remains peaceful is that the elites in East Asia, including the Japanese, the Koreans, the Chinese, the Taiwanese, the Indonesians, the Thais, the Singaporeans, and Malaysians, have all studied in American universities. And you know what happens? They use the same concepts, they understand each other, and they can get along with each other. Now, this is a remarkable contribution that American universities have made towards peace in East Asia that no one has fully recognized. So it, it's, it's in fact good for the world that America retains the best universities as long as it continues to train the best minds from the rest of the world in these universities. <coughs> Right up here. Thank you very much. My name is Peter Wu. I'm a junior at Harvard College. Uh, my question is, when China, or if China becomes number one, what is the future for Hong Kong and the future for Taiwan? Well, I think both will do very well. I mean, and for the simple reason that, you know, there is what I call a rising tide of prosperity uh, in the region. Now, they will have short-term political challenges. I mean, Hong Kong, uh, unfortunately, never ever developed the art of managing and resolving political disputes and so on and so forth. So it's going through a painful learning phase. And the same way, I think in Taiwan or so, you might have short-term uh, political problems. But by and large, both will remain more or less as autonomous economic entities benefiting from the growth uh, of the region. And I want to emphasize, since I come from Singapore, and Singapore and Hong Kong are seen as competitors all the time, it is actually in Singapore's national interest 
to see Hong Kong thrive and succeed because we need competition from another city-state and therefore we can both do equally well. Right up here. Hi, my name is Chi, um, last name Jai. I work for the internal think tank unit of a large American company. Um, thank you for presenting a view that perhaps not to the sophisticated audience here at Kennedy School, but I think perhaps in the US in general that is a little bit different. Um, I follow non-Western, specifically Chinese press as well, and I think the point of view that you presented is quite normal um, from a non-Western press coverage point of view, but if we look at the average Western press and the public discourse here, and hence policy here, that point of view perhaps is odd, um, just like you highlight with the Belgrade embassy bombing. We can actually have US and China looking at things from two totally different angles. So my question is, how do we bridge that public perception gap to then move toward more harmonious bilateral relations? Yeah, I mean, I must say that that's a very difficult question because I, the thing I mean, that, that, you know, as I get older, I get less and less surprised by things, you know, quite normal. But one thing that's really surprised me is that on the one hand, uh, the United States has clearly the freest media in the world, the best finance newspapers, the best finance television stations in the world. But I can tell you this, you know, as someone who travels to at least 30, 40 countries a year, when I come to the United States and I go to my hotel room in Charles Hotel and turn on the television, I feel that I've been cut off from the rest of the world. And literally, the insularity of the American discourse is actually frightening. And I, oh my, 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 this is also true, by the way. I mean, I've said this to my friends there anyway in New York Times. This is true of the New York Times. This is true of the uh, Washington Post. This is true of the Wall Street Journal. There is an incestuous, self-referential uh, discourse among these newspaper journalists and so on and so forth. And they reinforce each other's perspectives and end up misunderstanding the world. Because you know, the one key point I emphasize is that the era of Western domination of world history was a 200 year aberration. It's coming to an end. And as a result of it, you've got to learn to understand non-Western perspectives in the world. And it's actually quite frightening that in many ways, I find American intellectuals behind intellectuals, including in Serbia, where I just was, or Greece, or in Istanbul, because they are much more aware of what's happening in the world than most American intellectuals are. I don't know how to solve that problem. Right over here. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, my name is Ziad Raza. I'm a mid-career MPA candidate here, and also from Malaysia. So both Malaysia and Singapore and countries around East Asia have been benefiting greatly from the economic rise of China. We trade with China, we benefit from that. But there's also the specter of, um, of security. China's nine-dash claim on the South China Sea, um, you know, s some skirmishes along the way. And also the m increasing militarization of, of China is growing defense budget. So my question to you is, um, I think the entire world is looking to see whether China is true to its rhetoric of peaceful rise, but it's particularly relevant for East Asia, because we're so nearby and we're directly affected by this. So what are your thoughts on China's yeah. rise as not just an economic power, but also potentially a military power as well? Yeah, uh, again, very quickly. Number one, uh, overall, there's no doubt that China has been rising peacefully. But for some strange reason, and I would say in the years 2010 to 2012 or 13, China began to make serious mistakes in its foreign policy. The one big mistake it made, for example, uh, was when the Ch Japanese arrested the captain of a Chinese fishing trawler. The Chinese put enormous pressure on Japan to release the captain and they succeeded. And then, foolishly, they asked Japan for an apology. And I told my Chinese friends, you already humiliated the Japanese by forcing them to release the captain Chinese fishing trawler. Why humiliate them further by asking for an apology? 
then as you know, they made mistakes in the South China Sea. And in, for example, uh, in the uh, ASEAN foreign ministers meeting in July 2012 in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, uh, the ASEAN countries wanted to have a, use the usual reference to South China Sea. China put pressure on Cambodia, the chairman, to block it. And then for the first time in 47 years, the ASEAN countries failed to produce their usual boring, long, joint communique because of Chinese pressure. So they made serious mistakes. But what is astonishing to me is how quickly they learn from the mistakes. And I can tell you the most support, the, 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 one of the most surprising things I did in 2014 was to be invited to Beijing by two separate Chinese think tanks and in a fully recorded conversation. And they only asked me one question. Please tell me what mistakes has China made in its foreign policy? And I, I, was, I was stunned by that because, you know, I've never been invited to Washington, D.C. to talk about <laughs> mistakes in American foreign policy, but I get invited to Beijing. I mean, that's a sign of the times that is how different the world is today. So I think, and I think the Chinese, I want to emphasize one point. The Chinese themselves have not clearly made up what kind of power they want to be, and they are torn by contradictory impulses. And that's how we react to them, how we act as a role model for them that will make a huge difference. And here in the area of the military, I can tell you one key point I keep saying, it is now in America's national interest to stop aggressive naval patrolling 12 miles off China's shores, because if you do that 20 years from now, there'll be aggressive na Chinese naval patrolling 12 miles off California shores. Let's not push for that. Let's work towards a new world where we no longer have to use the military. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, there will be no war between the United States and China. Why not gradually de-escalate the military competition? I think it can be done. Right over here. Thank you. Thank you, David, and thank you, Kiso, for the great presentation. Uh, my name is Xing Chai Zhang. I'm from China. It's a great honor to have this opportunity to talk about, uh, to ask questions. I'm the founder of my lab tea company. And uh, my question is, you talk about uh, Mr. Xi Jinping and uh, talking about uh, our purpose to revive our culture. So what do, you what do you think is China's core culture and how, China can, how Chinese core culture can contribute to the world and what we can learn from other civilizations through, through this process? Thank you very much. Well, um, I, I suspect there are many more experts in this room here on Chinese culture and civilization, but I can tell you that there are obviously many roots of wisdom in traditional uh, Chinese uh, culture. And I'm actually hoping that, you know, if you look back over the longer history of China over the past 2,000 years or so, it's actually surprising how few military adventures the Chinese had overseas. And in, in general, they have actually, as you know, within the Chinese uh, Confucian ethos, the guy who's a soldier is at the bottom of the value chain, right? So, and so maybe developing a, 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 an ethos in which the military is not so important is one possible thing that can emerge from Chinese culture and civilization. But you'll see things coming in in many areas. For example, in the medical area, for example, I think Chinese medicine uh, will become more and more important. And just as you know, the, the Western medicine looks at the human body and tries to slice it up and looks at your kidney and looks at your liver and looks at your heart, the Chinese look at the whole system of the body and say, let's figure out the whole system. And I think in that sense, as Chinese medicine becomes, re, you know, rejuvenates itself, it'll also make a development. So there are many other such places like this. Uh, Chinese poetry, Chinese painting, all that will come back in a much stronger way. So you will actually see one of the happiest things I look forward to, for example, in the next 20 years is that there'll be not one, but many major Asian cultural renaissances taking place in the world. And one of them will be from China. Uh, right up here. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Hi, my name is Subin Kim. I'm a student at Harvard Law School. Um, thank you for coming to talk to us today. It was a great lecture. Um, some say AIIB is um, in some sense China's stepping stone towards um, 
possibly undermining US, uh, US dollars um, position as a reserve currency and preparing itself as the new reserve currency for the world or at least a competing alternative. I'm curious about your response to that, such arguments. Oh, I think, uh, I, I don't think the, the, the AIIIB is a step towards replacing the uh, US uh, dollar as the global reserve currency is actually the Chinese uh, basically using the AIIB on the one hand to find a use for the money that they have, and on the other hand, there's also a demand in Asia for more infrastructure. Even the ADB has estimated that Asia needs seven trillion dollars of infrastructure, and that's what it's using its money for. But at the same time, I do agree with you also that the Chinese have begun thinking about how long can they rely on the US dollar as the global reserve currency. Because traditionally, the, the, global, the reserve currency is always the reserve currency of the world's number one economic power. Now, China is not yet in nominal terms the number one economic power. But within five years, 10 years, depending on your uh, uh, guesswork on what the rates of growth will be, China will become the world's number one economic power, let's say within 10 years. And then in that world, if you have a world in which China is the number one world economic power and the US dollar remains at the global reserve currency, that will be a major global contradiction. So it's actually better for us now to find a solution to that global contradiction before it becomes a big problem because this will definitely be a big problem 10 years from now. Right over here. Yes, uh, my name is Charles Data. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, arguably, in the era of the US uh, superpower, uh, democracy could be argued as the main value that the U.S. has been pushing around the world. How about uh, when we imagine the day that China will be a superpower, what do you think will be the main agenda that will be pushed around the world? Okay, let me begin with the good news. They will not ask any country in the world to set up a communist party. <laughs> 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 I guarantee you that. Uh, I actually believe in the long run China itself will eventually become a democracy. The destination is not in doubt, it's only the route and timing that you take. And I can tell you the Chinese learned so much from the collapse of the Soviet Communist Party because the Soviet Union went overnight from a communist system to a democracy, the Russian economy imploded, became smaller than Belgium, uh, infant mortality rates went up, life expectancy came down, and the Chinese saw that and said, we don't want to see that in China. So they will not make an immediate transition uh, towards democracy, but in the long run, I think they'll move in that direction. But unlike the United States of America, the Chinese do not believe in proselytizing their beliefs. They do not believe that you have to copy or emulate them to succeed. And they also believe that it is far better for people to admire and respect them for their deeds rather than to pay attention to their words. So the, in a sense, we will have a very different world when the world's number one power in the world is no longer a missionary power in the world. Right over here. Technological institution down the river. Um, this, mm -hmm. My question is similar to the one that was uh, just asked. Uh, I think your point is very well taken that you learn how to behave when you're not number one by looking at the person who's now number one. We're good to our parents so our children will take care of us in our, mm. our old age. Mm. But how many years after China becomes number one do you think there would be real press freedom or artists would have freedom or the Dalai Lama could come to Tibet? Uh, how will that ever really happen with the communist dynasty that you praise, which you can only get away with in Cambridge, by the way. Mm. Uh, well, the, um, you know, the question of uh, freedom in China, I think, is a very critical question. You know, I first went to China in 1980, and I arrived in Beijing. For a start, there were no skyscrapers. 
there were big roads, there were no cars, only bicycles. People walk, People at the time could not have the freedom to choose where to live, where to work, what to wear, you know. No, not, not any kind of personal freedom. Today, you go to China, the Chinese people can choose where to live, where to work, what to study, what to wear, where to go. And you know, when I first went to China in 1980, not, there wasn't a single Chinese tourist leaving China. Last year, 100 million Chinese went overseas freely. And a hundred million Chinese returned to China freely. Now, if there's no freedom in China, if China was this despotic, oppressive state, would a hundred million Chinese come back to China? So clearly there has been an explosion of personal freedoms in China on a scale that the Chinese people haven't experienced, right? Now, you mentioned uh, uh, difficult things like the Dalai Lama. And I agree with you that China should deal with the Dalai Lama. But isn't it shocking that the United States of America, which is the world's freest society in, any way, in, in many ways, actually prevented some Islamic scholars from coming to teach in American universities barely 10 years ago. That's shocking. So, and all I can say to you is, no country is perfect. Every country has got to learn to improve itself. Uh, Kishore, I want to take advantage of my position here to ask you a question that no one else has seemed to ask, but since you asked it uh, rhetorically yourself is, after Lee Kuan Yew, can Singapore survive? <laughs> <laughs> you know, my favorite answer is by the book. <laughs> no, I, 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 I actually, I, I did. Say, <laughs> that's not generally an acceptable answer here. So. I know, I know, I know. No, no. I, actually, I did launch a book three weeks ago in Singapore called "Can Singapore Survive?" But I, I'm actually the answer I give is very simple. The probability, of course, is that Singapore will survive. I mean, Singapore will not just survive, Singapore will do very well. Because, you know, the, uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and the founding leaders of Singapore created some of the strongest institutions in the world in some areas. We, the quality of mind of the Singapore civil service, I think, is number one in the world. The quality of mind of the Singapore judiciary is also probably number one uh, in the world. The quality of the Singapore military is probably among the top ten uh, in the world. Singapore's education system is already ranked among the top three or four in the world. We have the world's best airport, the world's best functioning port. So we have created a whole ecosystem of excellence uh, in Singapore. And with that ecosystem of excellence, Singapore is poised to take advantage of a major historical opportunity that is coming its way because just as London served the European century and New York served the American century, the one city in all of Asia that is comfortable with all the major civilizations in Asia, with Chinese civilization, with Indian civilization, with Islamic civilization, and also Western civilization, is Singapore. So Singapore is going to become the New York of the Asian century. <laughs> so it's a great time coming ahead for Singapore. But, okay, right there. Uh, uh, my name is Ihab El Gamal. I'm a mid-career uh, from the troubled area of the Middle East. Uh, my question to you is that do you have any doubt about China's um, economic growth going forward? So the rise to the number one is based on a wonder story of 8% growth year over year. Yeah. Um, demographically, there is a challenges. There's a lot of challenges in mm. the economy. Do you see the story really continuing mm. to become the nominal number yeah. one in the world? Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you raised that question because I've been here for 48 hours and I must say almost every person I met in Harvard, the first question they asked me when we talk about China is, can China sustain its economic growth? 
And of course, it's possible that there could be a massive slowdown in China. They could go to grow at three, four percent, or whatever. So that's possible. But if I was a betting man, I'm prepared to take bets with you all that I think China will be able to sustain growth of seven percent. Now, the re one there's a there's a very good reason why the Chinese have decided to slow down their economic growth because they are now shifting from one model of economic growth to another model of economic growth. They used to re rely a lot on uh, export-led growth. They can no longer do that because they're no longer the big markets in the West that they can rely on. They're trying to switch to an internal consumption-led growth. And it takes time to do that. And if you are running a fast train around a corner, it's best to slow down and do that. And secondly, you know, if you look at the amount of investments that China has put in, the infrastructure, the world-class infrastructure that Ch China has built in their ports, airports, roads, rail, and so on and so forth, that kind of world-class infrastructure reaps dividends. Plus, the Chinese Communist Party is in many ways one of the most meritocratic organizations in the world, and the quality of mind of key Chinese policymakers has never been as good as it is today. Now, if you have a, a, a government staffed by remarkably good minds taking advantage of a, a world-class infrastructure, I would say the possibility of maintaining good growth is, 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 is there. And within Asia, by the way, you know, the China is big, but even the, 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 the Chinese are 1.3 billion people, but in all of Asia, there are 3.5, uh, 4 billion people. That market is becoming more integrated too. So that, that you also benefit from the integration uh, of that region. So there are many other sources of growth apart from the export that growth that they had in the past. So I, if I was a betting man, I would say they can sustain the 7% growth. All right, I'm afraid we have time for just two more questions right there. Hi, uh, my name is Jack Mulhern. I'm a former tour guide at the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library. Um, I just had a quick question. One thing, it's a great honor for, to have you here, first of all. But um, I attended the law school about six months ago, and Tommy Coe, the U.S. ambassador to Singapore, he posited a theory that 11 times uh, one country has always been on top, and they've always, in the history of humanity, been superseded by the country in number two. I'm just wondering if this is inevitable due to what I've noticed China's doing. They're buying factories in Indiana that are producing rare earth elements that we need for our cell phones and our F-14 and F-16 fighter jets and so forth. And I'm not saying that they're not benign. I'm just saying that this is what's happening. And so I'm wondering if it's an inevitability that the country who's always number two supersedes the country that's now economically number one. Well, I... I'm not, Tommy Koch, by the way, uh, uh, is a Singapore ambassador, former Singapore ambassador to the U.S., a brilliant guy. In fact, I succeeded him as ambassador to the U.N. Uh, I would say, I mean, yeah, of course, it's never inevitable that the number two will overtake number one. As you know, Japan was supposed to overtake, uh, and I see that uh, Professor Ezra Vogel has left, but he wrote the famous book saying Japan is number one, uh, and, and the Japanese never became number one. And that happens from time to time. And it's conceivable that China will not become number one. It's conceivable. But, you know, the probability is very clear that, you know, if you have a country with a population of 1.3 billion people, China, and a country of 300 million people, United States, if the average Chinese can perform at 25% the level of the average American, China, will have a bigger economy. And if you have any doubts about the capacity of the Chinese mind to do well, look at the exam yeah. results of Chinese students in any leading American university, right? You look at the list of PhDs that come to collect, you see the success of the Chinese intellectual. So what's happening here, by the way, is that you know, I always say that you know, Western education was developed for the Western mind. But one thing we haven't noticed is that in the last 10 years, when you take Western education and you combine it with an Asian mind, including the Chinese mind, it has an explosive effect. So the Asians are thriving with Western education, 
And inevitably, this is going to fuel the rise of China in a big way. And I'm very confident that the average Chinese can perform more than 25% the level of the average American. And that's why I think China will have a bigger economy. Right over here, I'm afraid the last question. Hello, um, my name is Mabo Mwesla. I'm a student at the business school. So thank you for being here this evening. My question is, how would you characterize in all likelihood the um, US-China relationship, specifically in the range of 15 to 25 years, where while China will likely be the number one, the US will likely be a close number two? Uh, yeah, it, 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 of course it's, it's possible that the uh, United States will be a close uh, number two to uh, China. But, you know, many of the projections that I've seen, I'll give you, for example, Goldman Sachs has project projected that by 2050, the number one economy in the world will be China, and I've been speaking a lot about China. The number two economy in the world will be India, and the United States will be number three. So, and it's, it's actually surprising that so few Americans uh, speak about that world. It's, it's, it's already impossible to speak about being number two. It's even harder to speak about being uh, uh, number three. But that, frankly, is also going to happen. You know, I, uh, I, I wrote an essay recently in which I said that, you know, if you look at the most successful ethnic community in the United States, huh, every, I would have thought in the past it would have been the Japanese or the Chinese or the Koreans or the Jews. But the most successful ethnic community in the United States by far is the ethnic Indian community. And if you look at one statistic, if the average Indian in India can achieve half the per capita income of the average Indian in America, India's GNP would not be two trillion, but 25 trillion. And if you go to India, as I do, the sense of optimism about the future is phenomenal. So I've been talking a lot about China, 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 but there's actually another bigger Asian story. There's also India and other states uh, that are doing very well. So in that world of tomorrow, it is just by sheer mathematical logic. The amount of space that 300 million Americans have carved out for themselves politically, economically, when they represent less than 5% of the world's population has been phenomenal, has been exceptional. But it cannot carry on because the rest of the world has stopped underperforming. And if they start performing normally, and America will continue to remain a strong, dynamic, successful country, but its relative share of the global GNP can only shrink. Dean Mabobani, thank you so much. It's been very nice. I should say we're going to have a reception here momentarily, so those of you who would like to stay and chat a bit more. Uh, Kishore has uh, a flight, I think, about, has to leave here about 8.15, but at least to be around for a little while for those of you that didn't get a chance to question. Thanks again.